2 i told us on wednesday the bible says and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in in breaking of bread and in prayers now and i told us on wednesday service that the apostles gave them a doctrine that a doctrine is a pattern the apostles gave them a doctrine for them to continue in and on wednesday i told us that the first major doctrine that every born again christian should continue in is the doctrine of daily devotion to god in studying the bible and in prayers that is reading your bible and praying should be part of your life daily it's a doctrine if you are born again you don't have a prayer life you are born again you don't have a bible study life we should doubt your salvation how are you going to be say how are you born again and you are not hungry to you know it's like bible study is like eating natural food that's how it is to us that are spiritual as we cannot do without eating in the physical we cannot do without study there will be this hunger now if you are born again you will notice that hunger that drive in your heart that there is a burden to know god more it is that burden that drives us to the place of study i told us on wednesday today we are going to look at another doctrine that must be part of our life revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and 10 let's look at the second doctrine that the early church had understanding of revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and verse 10 can we have it on screen revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and verse 10 can we read together after the count of three in honor of god's word can we be on our feet let's honor god's word together as we stand up to read one two and let's read so you could be on your feet let's go and they sang his new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to god by your blood out of every tribe and thong and people and nation you know we are from different tribes from different thongs please bring Uriel out for me bring different tribes different thongs that's where we came from amen now what has he redeemed us to become let's read verse 10 together and have made us kings and what and priests to our god and we shall reign where on earth for how long okay he stopped it there and we shall reign on earth he he and has made us kings and priests. So if somebody asks you, who are you? Say, I'm a king. I didn't hear you. Who are you? I didn't hear you. I'm a king. Now, in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So we all are queen, kings. So who am I? Who are you? I'm a king. Now, secondly, who are you? I'm a priest. So we were made in Christ kings and what? And priests. Let's have our seats. Now, that's what we are going to look at this morning in our service. We are made kings and priests. So, you must not see yourself as an ordinary person anymore. We are redeemed. Now, I wrote here, they made the saints understand that they are to reign on earth. Let's look at that. Now, our reigning place is not in heaven. Where are we to reign? Here on earth. Now, our reigning place, Ibitu Yekati Joba, to your country mawa to your country kati lokiki aye ini we are supposed to reign here on earth so it means that every child of god is not supposed to be a non-entity on earth you are not supposed to be a push away that's why i pray in the name of jesus may your understanding be awakened now may you begin to shine as the light that you are he said i made us kings and priests to our god and we shall reign now, I will tell you as we go deeper, we shall reign as kings, we shall reign as priests, here or not. Here or not. So, stop thinking that the, the art is just a place where you come here and just struggle. and they, No, no. It's a place where you have come to reign. 
if there are certain of your spirit or your rights that you are yet to ask for you begin to ask for them but for us to reign we must live as these two we must live as priests and we must live as kings so today we are going to study what it is hallelujah i wrote you so today we shall be looking at what is expected of kings and priests who will reign here or not now and i ask a question what does the priestly ministry shows now what does it mean when it says we are to reign as priests here or not the priestly aspect of the life of the saints points to what purity now when you talk about a priest you are talking about somebody that is living the life of god you know i've been mentioning this life of god for about three months now if you are conversant with what i've been teaching you now in the life of a priest is the life of anyone living the god kind of life it means that for you to live as priests here or not, you must live a godly life. Purity must show. You cannot say you are born again, Jesus has redeemed you, and you are living the life of sin. Now that's one of the things that will not make you rain on earth. So many Christians are confessing to have known Jesus, confessing that they have become born again, but their lives does not manifest that they are priests in the kingdom. Their life does not manifest the purity that the life of God should show. I wrote here, this means that we should manifest God in our life. People should relate with us, you know, and begin to say, this one has indeed met God. Now, God should not just only be on our lips. Yeah, they are born again. No, no, no. God should manifest in our lives. When people come closer to us, they should be able to testify that truly oh, these ones have met God. They have met Jesus. They are saved. They are different kind of species. They are different kinds of people. Now, our life should manifest the godliness that the Bible talks about. I saw something in Acts chapter 6. They were to choose people that will serve in the church. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Look at the first thing they require. The first qualification was not even their title. The first qualification was not how long they've been in church. Look at it. And no, Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. I'm waiting for you to put it on screen so that we all can see. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Let's look at it together. The Bible says, Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of what? Of what? Of good reputation. Now, the old King James, show me the old King James. It will say, seven men of honest report. Show us the old King James version. Seven men, yes. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of what? Honest report. That's the first thing. It's not men who have stayed long in church. It's not men who are elderly. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter their size. It doesn't matter if they are Jew or not. It's about look for us. Several men whose reports are honest. You know what it means to have a honest report? It means that you have lived a life that cannot be questioned by any means. That's what it means to be born again. Praise the Lord. Men of honest reports. People who, who we see, sorry, whose attitude are actually showing that they have really met Jesus. That's what it means. To be a priest here on earth. Your life begins to manifest the purity of Jesus. Not that when people begin to ask you, they see, they come closer to you, they see that your Bible is big. They even ask you, you have a title. But when they come closer to you, they doubt whether you met Jesus or not. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at it. Verse chapter, 1 Timothy chapter, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. He said to Timothy, you must set yourself as an example which means you must be an example to all in this area first timothy chapter 4 and verse 12 first timothy 4 12 first timothy 4 12 4 12 not yes let no man despise thy youth timothy but be thou an example of believers in what in words in what in conversations in what in charity in what? In spirit. In what? In faith. Then he went further to say in what? In purity. 
That is, you must be an example to every believer in the aspect of being pure. So, look at yourself, beat your hand on your chest and say, I'm a priest. Now, and what is required of a priest? A priest must walk in purity. I ask a question here that I'm going to answer. What does it cost to walk in purity? Because we are hearing so a lot of things now on the internet. Some will say, you are born again once you are born again for life. Some will say, no matter how you live your life, you will still remain a child of God. That, oh, your sins no longer count the moment you are born again. Even after being born again, you don't need to change anything. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The moment you are born again, beloved, you have to what, mandate yourself to live the life of Christ. Let's look at this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. Look at what Paul said. What does it take to walk in purity? It takes a lot of self-discipline. Because your body, your flesh does not want to do the will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I think verse, 20, verse 27, sorry. Verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Your body doesn't want to do the will of God. He said, but look at this. Paul is saying, he said, but I discipline myself. Can you see that? Your body doesn't want to do it. Your flesh wants to do the wrong thing. Even after you are born again, the desire for sin still wants to come into your heart. Even after you are born again, the devil will send people around you to try to tempt you to do what is wrong even after you are born again but look at it he said but i discipline my body but i what i discipline my body i come again but what i discipline my body and bring it into subjection least when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified can you see i i i discipline my body and bring it into subjection. It means that your body doesn't want to do the right thing. But for you to be a priest that will reign on earth, you have to tell your body, no, I can't always give you everything you are desiring. Your, your body wants to be angry. Your body wants to keep malice. Your body wants to react to some things. But you always remember that, ah, ah and I'm born again. Ah, and I'm born again. Ah, and I'm born again. You know, your body wants to tell you, uh, to go, and go, go and tell him, go and tell her uh, that the reason why you cannot fulfill that, you, that, that person borrowed you money or gave you an opportunity and though you have the money, you have a need. And you are saying, well, I will, I will go and tell him or her that I can't I can meet up. Now, the, being a priest will make you consider God's position first. Now, what, what will I be? Will I represent God well? Praise the Lord. I wrote here the fleshy desires, the flesh desires, uh, sorry, the fleshy desires things that are not the will of God, not things of the spirit. It only wants to do the things of the flesh, sinful things. But a determined mind to do the will of God, hear me, will help you and make purity a possibility. A determined mind. I will do the will of God. It's one of the things that will make you to live the life of God. A determined mind. Without it, beloved, hear me. You can't live the life of God. Praise the Lord. So when we talk about you being a priest, a priest represents the purity of Christ. Now let's look at the kingship aspect of, of you. Hallelujah. Now the kingly aspect of the saints talks about royalty. It talks about royalty. As a believer, you are a king. The earlier you begin to see yourself that way, the better. Now, I've told you that your priestly aspect represents purity. The kingly aspect represents royalty. You must always carry yourself as a king in Christ. Say, I'm a king. Yes, I'm a king. You must always carry yourself as a king in Christ. I'm going to address about three aspects of our lives in this service before we close. Now, the first one that I want to address is, listen. And I want you to pay attention. Kings don't talk anyhow. Now, go and study the kingly aspect. That's why you will see that. Look up. Like, for instance, in Ibadan now. Let me use Ibadan. I'm, I'm an Ibadan man. I live in your state. In Ibadan, when they want to begin to prepare the people that will, that will line up as kings, their first major title is that they call them Magaji. Now, 
For instance, Mogaji in Leafolabi, which means their Folabis will present somebody. Amen. Now they were first ballet, they become Mogaji. Now, when they are Mogaji of their family, they will be coming to the palace. They will meet with the king. They will discuss with the king. Now, they are sitting as king, they are king to be in line of kings. Now, you know what they are doing? All the while, they will be learning how kings talk. I will still come to dressing. They will be learning how kings, they don't, you don't just wake somebody up, but, but, but this morning I say, become a king tomorrow. That's why you see that when they get to the position of a king, you will see that everything about their life is different. You know why? They were prepared for it. Now, so many Christians don't understand how to rule as kings. They don't understand who they are in Christ. You know, one of the things we notice with kings is that kings don't talk anyhow. You can't just imagine kings will just speak any words because his slang is popular, a word is popular. The king of the word of a king is very expensive. So they are careful in speaking it because anybody can hold on to it. Now let's look at it. In Colossians chapter 4. We'll look at three scriptures here. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Look at how the word of kings should be. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Please, we are going to read three versions. We'll read King James, uh, we'll, Old King James. We'll read Amplified and we are going to end it with Message Bible. Show me the Old King James Version. Old King James Version. Thank you. He said, let your speech be always what? With grace. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Wait for me here. Let your speech be always with grace. Seasoned with salt. You know how we season our food with salt. You know, of recent, uh, I we decided to, to change how we eat. So, it's either no salt or just a pinch of salt. So, when we finished cooking, I learned that from Pastor Matthew. Pastor Matthew said, when you get to 50 years, your salt level must drop. So, Somebody now asked him, that sir, will the food have taste? He said, you generate the taste by yourself. So we started trying it. When we started at first, car, ah, it's like nothing was working. Now, you know what salt does to food? Whatsoever ingredients you are bringing, salt is what will bring the taste out. Now, and the Bible says, your word, your word, sorry, the word of your mouth must always be seasoned with salt. It means that every time a Christian speak, people should find wisdom in your words. A Christian is not supposed to talk anyhow. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Every time a Christian speaks, there should be wisdom. Let's look at the Amplified Version. Amplified Version. Amplified Version. Thank you. It says, let your speech at all times be what? Gracious. In brackets. Pleasant and winsome seasoned as it were with salt so that you may never be at a loss to know how you ought to answer anyone who puts a question beside yeah, before you. Can you see? That's why as a Christian you cannot just speak just the way you feel. Now it means that you must process the words of your mouth in, well in your heart before bringing okay this message Bible this one says, be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in, in others in a conversation. Not put down, not cut out. Why do you think there are crises in several marriages? At times, the point is right, but the presentation is bad. The point is right. Now, and a lot of people, the, the reason why they throw their points away is because the presentation is bad. And that's why I always cancel, especially women in marriage. When you have something to say to your husband, please focus on the point. Now, what do I want to say? And I always tell the, woman, the men too, if your wife is speaking, don't just pay attention to the words. Find out the point she's trying to drive at. But I'm talking to kings now. Kings don't talk carelessly. Your words must always bring solution. Now look at another scripture. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. We are also going to see Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Let's start it all over again from um, King James Version. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. The way kings talk. Now look at this. He said, don't use foul, foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Look at this. Let us not, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good. Now, show us the uh, message Bible. Message Bible. Okay, this one says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, what's a corrupt co communication? Now, because a slang is popular, does not mean you should join them to say it. You are a king. Can you just imagine, let the king of our land, maybe for instance, the Uluba Donfibado come up now and say, he wants to address you, and he starts by saying, oh, ah, anyway, okay, eh, eh, it, me too, to jassy. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to use, sorry, to the use of edifying that it may minister grace. Can you see? To hear us. You are a king. Say I'm a king. You don't talk anyhow. You don't allow corrupt words to come out of your mouth. Now look at the next one. It says, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. That's why at times I look at Christians have misunderstanding in a Christian marriage and you are saying you are stupid. I have never opened my mouth for once to even speak those words to even my children. Not to talk about my wife. When me and my wife have misunderstanding, some of you will be saying, Pastor, what, how do you show your misunderstanding? I don't like what you have said, what you did. I don't like what you did. I don't like it. I do. That's how Christians, we are always careful, conscious of what we speak. Because we have the understanding that we don't use vowel language. How can a Christian look at a fellow person and say, you are a fool? You are an idiot. What will you do? You are mad. Ah, born again? We should doubt your salvation. And for the scripture to say, watch the way you talk, it means that you have capacity to control the words of your mouth. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Let's take one more scripture on that. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. Sagad Abaskin the label say. He said, but you know better now. So make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper. Irritability means, okay, profanity and what? Dirty talk. But you know better. So make sure it is gone for good. Now what should be gone for good from your, from your mouth? Dirty talk must be gone. Dirty talk must never be part of your speech. That's why I wrote here, I want to read out. Always consider your status before you allow words to come out of your mouth. Always consider your status before you allow words to come out of your mouth. Always consider your status before you allow words to come out of your mouth. Always consider your status before you allow words to come out of your mouth. You, of your mouth. you are a king. You should never allow belittling words to come out of your mouth. So watch what you say. Let's look at the second one. We are showing you how to manifest as the king that you are. Number two. Kings don't dress anyhow. One of the things that is related to royalty is decency. You know, I took time and I told them to goggle for me. They will bring out those pictures one after the other. I told them to find kings all over the world. Now, so that you and I can see, let's look at how kings dress. I discovered that royalty and decency are related. A royal person is always decent in his dress. That's why as a child of God, when you finish dressing up, ask yourself before you go out to the public, do I look like a king? 
Can kings dress like this? Wait, I'm, it's not yet time. Hold on. Can, can kings dress like this? Ask yourself before you agree to just jump out. You know, they are wearing so many nonsense now. You see, born again Christian. What's the name of that one that they are wearing that the cloth will get to the stomach? It will not get to the skirt or to the trouser. Jumped up. Now, these are things... You don't see these things with kings. You don't see these things with kings. I will show you. In fact, from kings abroad and kings here in Nigeria, I will show you one after the other. Kings are always decent in their dressing. Let's start. Please begin to show me those pictures. Let's take them. I think the first one they showed us here is King Charles of um, England. Can you bold in it? This is a yes. Whoever is behind you are too fast. Take it one after. Let's go back to King King Charles. This one is uh, the, uh, the Queen of um, uh, Sweden, but this is King Charles. Now this is him. He's dressed to go out. King are always decent. Does he look like a tout? Answer me now. No, now. Will you see this one outside and not say this man is respectable? Now, this is a king. Now, show me another one. Let's look at another one. I think this is the queen of, I think this is the queen of in, uh, Sweden now. England, okay. Is that King Charles' wife? Okay, that's King Charles' wife. Now, look at, look at her chest region. Is there anything revealing any private part out? No, they don't dress that, that way. You know why? They, there are people that teaches them when, in, when they are preparing them for kingship, they take them through the protocol, the training. Now, this is his wife. Look at how dressed. In fact, there was one I also want to say. Uh, that's a Meg, Meg, is it Megan or whatever is her name. She's also a queen in England. Okay. Which one is this as well? Yeah. Okay, that's King Charles and his wife. Now, this is the king of Denmark now. The, yes. Can you see them? This is how kings dress. Now, I'm not saying wear suits. In their own tradition, kings wear suits. I will show you our own tradition when we get to that point. But I'm just trying to show you the decency that is associated with kingship. Show me the next one. Okay, this is king of our own Benin, Nigeria. This is our own king in Benin kingdom here. Now, look at his dressing. What does this show? It shows decency. You won't see him open up and, sh and show his chest. It is a slave behind him that ties wrapper and exposes the shirt. You are no longer a slave. In Christ Jesus, you are a son. In Christ Jesus, you are a king. Say I'm a king. Let's move on. This one, okay. This is the king uh, of um, Sweden. Okay, yes. Show me his wife. Very decent. This is his wife. Even in her off shoulder. Now look at that. Even in her off shoulder, can you see that the dress even came up? You are a king. Represents Jesus well. Take us for that. Take us for that. There's no time. Bale gada basende. Yes, take us further. Take us further. Is that all? Okay. E example. There was one you showed me. The, king, the queen of Benin and his wife. You didn't pick up that. Okay, let's go on. So, back to what we're saying. In our dressing, listen. Our dressing must show decency. We are children of God. We are born again. And this was exactly what uh, 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 um, Peter was sharing in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, when he was talking about our, our beauty should not just be only by outward ador uh, uh, you know, adorance. But if you look at what's happening today now, so many things have entered the church. Now, you see children of God born again coming to church. They will sit in front. They, they will have to need an handkerchief to be able to support their skirts because they themselves know it's too short. Sam so I'm a king. I didn't hear you. 
you are a child of God. You are a king. You cannot afford to dress anyhow. I wrote here, kings are very decent in their dressing. They don't expose their private. This is why it is important you consider your status ever before you make a choice on what to choose to wear. Now, what should you consider before you make a choice on what to wear? You consider your status. You know why I'm repeating it? I don't want you to forget. I want you to register in your memory. I'm a king. I cannot dress anyhow. So if I'm going to dress, the first thing I must remember is my status, who I am. I was taking the workers a few weeks ago and I was teaching them about dressing in the workers meeting. And I told them that, do you actually know that your dress is a message? Your dressing is, is speaking something. Your dress is a language. There are people that don't understand the language you are speaking when you don't talk, when you dress. Some people look at you and understand that this lady is trying to look for a sex partner. There's a way you dress. Some people will look at you and this man cannot be trusted. Your dress is actually saying something. That's why you can't say everybody is dressing this way and because everybody is dressing this way, I have no choice. I'm to be always beautiful. I have to join them. No. You must always dress to befit your status as a king. Our mommy in the Lord shared an, uh, an experience with us. They traveled out of the country to minister somewhere. She said as they got there, she opened her box, her bag to pick the first dress. She wore it and the Spirit of God said, look at the clothes. She said she wanted to remove it because it was glittering. He said, but the Spirit of God said, do you know that this cloth actually represents me well? He said that was where she caught the encounter that I, I should not just dress just because I want to dress. I should dress because I'm a representative of Jesus. Now look at the Queen of Sheba, 1 Kings chapter 10 from verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 10. From verse 1. First Kings chapter 10. From verse 1. The queen of Sheba heard about Solomon and his connection with the name of God. She came to put his reputation to the, to the test by asking tough questions. Verse 2. She made a grand and showy entrance into Jerusalem. Camels loaded with spices, a huge amount of gold and precious gems. She came to Solomon and, and talked about all the things she cared about, emptying her heart to him. Verse 3, Solomon answered everything she put to him. Nothing stumped him. Verse 4, when the queen of Sheba, ex, sorry, when the, when the queen of Sheba experienced for herself Solomon's wisdom, and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built. Now, look at that. She stopped from hearing. She now switched into what? Sighting. And what was his, her first focus? The project, the building. She saw the building. Yes, move on. Next, next verse. The meals that were served. The impressive array of court officials. What does that array mean? The dressing of the court officials and sharply dressed waiters. Can you see what she was looking at? The lavish crystals and the elaborate worship extravagance with whole burnt offerings at the steps leading up to the temple of God. It took her breath away. Now, it took her breath away is just it's a slang. A figurative speech. She was moved by the way they dressed in the palace. You are a king. Anytime you are dressing, you must always put that in your mind. You dress like a king. When people see you, they should say, they, should, they, should say they, they have seen kings in Christ. Don't dress anyhow. Don't dress anyhow. Like I said earlier on, your dress is a language on its own. What you wear is actually saying something. Your dress is a language on its own. What you wear is actually saying something. 
That's why you must be careful what you are saying with the kind of dressing you are putting on. I'm a king. So, program it in your mindset. You are a king. Let's take the last one. Number three, kings don't mingle anyhow. I come again. Kings don't mingle anyhow. I come again. Kings don't mingle anyhow. You must be careful where you go. You are a king. We are studying Revelation 5, 9 and 10. You don't see kings just anywhere, anyhow, every place. We went to uh, my daughter's uh, um, matric at Oyo on Friday. And while I sat, we, while we were in the, in the hostel area, I saw siren coming in. Some police officers, so vehicle with siren, you know, their convoy has entered. So I asked my daughter. He said, uh, a king is actually one of their roommates. A king's daughter. Now, you won't see that king go out just anyhow. Now, when we now go to the matriculation hall, where he sat, the man that held his uh, staff of office, his staff of office, they called that, you know, was with him. Security men were. The, the place they put him, so honorable, honorable place. When they finished the matric, he's, when he was celebrating with his daughter, the place of celebration, you know, he started to speak to my heart. Because if you look at these natural kings, it will help you to understand how to live your life as a, as a king in Christ. You don't just mingle anywhere. You don't just enter any place to just sit down. And say, I'm, you know, for instance, uh, uh, my mentor was sharing with us our experience. He said those days, early stage of our life, she would just buy suya on the road, you know, and be eating and be going. You won't see kings live like that. See, I'm a king. Now, begin to move with that understanding. Kings don't mingle just anywhere. Not that everybody is going here, I'm also going. You're a child of God. They do their things in royal ways. You will always see royalty manifest in all they do. That's why, hear me. Kings will always befriend kings. That's why children of God will always befriend children of God. I always tell people, if your best friend is an unbeliever, for instance, hear me. You are born again. And your best friend is a non-believer. Can I tell you the truth? There's a compromise somewhere. Something is wrong. Because a fish and a bird cannot be friends. Where will they meet? In the sea? On air? The fish will die on air. The bird will die in the sea. Now, which means, if your best friend is a non-believer, what do you discuss? I can hardly mention, uh, speak for one minute without talking about Jesus. So, if my friend is a non-believer, it should either be, be, maybe I'm hiding the Jesus that I have, or I don't even have him at all. Praise the Lord. I didn't hear you. Praise the Lord. So, begin to see yourself this way. Let's summarize with that scripture again. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Oh, yeah, God, I'm sending them. Say, Sagada Baske, and they sang a new song. Wadi, take the scroll, open its seal, slain, pain in blood. You bought men and women bought them back from over the earth. Bought them back for God. To become what? In verse 10. Then you made them a kingdom. Priests for our God. Priest kings to rule 
over the earth. And I told you that as priests, you should manifest royalty. As kings, you should manifest, as priests, you should manifest uh, purity. As kings, you should manifest royalty. So make up your mind to begin to live the life of God from now. I'm born again. I'm a priest. I will not put my hands into anything that is sinful. I'm born again. I'm a priest. I will not do anything that will make his presence depart from me. I'm born again. I'm a king. Now, and as a king, my life must manifest royalty. I must not talk anyhow. That language, foul language, dirty words, I, I showed you from scriptures, must not come out of my mouth. As a king, I cannot afford to dress like a slave. And I told you that in the dressing of kings will always show what? Decency. Kings dress in decent forms. And the last one I told you that as kings, you can't afford to mingle just anyhow. You can't say everybody is going this way, I'm going that way. You are kings. And where are you supposed to reign? When I started, I told you, we are to reign here on earth. Let's be on our feet. Let's pray. We are going to declare. Let the king in me begin to manifest. Open your mouth and begin to pray. Let the king in me that I am begin to manifest in the name of Jesus. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Let me hear your voice. My fear is gone. I can't hear you pray. Because I know oh, oh, he holds my future. My life is what I live in just because he lives. Because he lives, because he. Let me hear your voice. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, because he lives. My fear is gone. Because I know. Shagada bara bara basede. Oh, he holds my future. My life is worth I live in just because he lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the worship. We adore you, O oh God, for what you've done again today. We ask that the seed of the word planted in our hearts will not depart from our hearts in Jesus' name. Father, we ask for grace to discipline ourselves in order to live the life of God in Jesus' name. I pray, O oh God, let our understanding be open, O oh God, to manifest the reality of the throne of kingship in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. I rebuke from our tongue every foul language in Jesus' name. Take all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name precious name we have prayed and amen praise the lord i declare that you are blessed as